So we're moving on to our final poet, the sixth of the six, uh, John Keats, um, whom almost everybody likes. It's a funny thing. I'm not quite sure how he manages to achieve that, but he does. He, he manages to be liked where almost all the other poets have somebody who really dislikes them or takes a strong exception that Keats doesn't. Um, he's the latest of the second generation poets, uh, born in 1795 and dies in 1821. So he, he dies at a very young age. Doesn't even <laughs> reach his 26th birthday. Um, but he's of the second generation along with Lord Byron and Percy Shelley. Um, and so I've taken them as the last. And uh, he was, he'd only been publishing as a poet for four years when he died of tuberculosis. So unlike Shelley who drowned and Byron who also died of a young age, but from ill health, but away from home. Actually, they all died on the continent, the three of them, which is interesting. Uh, the first generation stayed in England. The second generation went abroad, in part because of their radicalism, um, but also poor health. Keats, Keats went there to try and um, hopefully recover his health from the tuberculosis, which he realized that he had um, managed to infect himself with from uh, relating to uh, relatives who were sick with it. He saw many people die with tuberculosis. He's interesting uh, because he also had some sort of formal medical training. Um, but unlike Shelley and, and Byron, he was not a member of the aristocracy. He was just a commoner and uh, born in London as well. Um, he, unlike, again, unlike Byron and unlike Shelley, was not associated with political radicalism. And when I said that everyone likes Keats, this is probably the reason he stayed out of politics. Uh, by and large, it's not that he had no political sympathies, but he didn't really put himself into politics that way. Um, but his odes became vastly influential in the Victorian period. And his uh, poetic vocabulary, his poetic uh, style uh, is very easy on the ear. And uh, he uh, creates memorable images that seem more effective than Shelley. Shelley's image is sort of blossom and then fade very quickly. Keats sustains the lyrical quality without that evanescence in it. Um, so let me say a little bit background here. Um, as I say, born in London, 31st of October, 1795. So Halloween. Eldest of four. Um, and uh, his he was uh, born probably in an inn, very humble origin. Um, his parents wanted him to be sent to one of the public schools, Eton or Harrow, uh, but they couldn't afford it. And uh, he was sent instead to, a, uh, to John Clark School at Anfield, close to where his grandparents lived, a very liberal school of progressive by the standards of the day. Okay. Um, and uh, a more of a modern curriculum than the classical schools of his day. The others, they wouldn't be called classical, but, the, but those uh, schools like, like Eton and Harrow would have taught Greek and Latin. And uh, uh, his school would have been more, would have emphasized more the modern writers. Uh, he, did, he developed an interest in classics and history all the same. And he retained interest in that, as we will see. First poem we're going to look at, or maybe the second, is on reading Chapman's Homer. But note that it's a translation. He's not reading it in Greek. He's reading it in the English translation. Very interested in the, in the Greeks, however. And we'll see the influence of uh, Greek art, Greek literature on his writing. 
Uh, also very interested in Edmund Spencer and in Milton and in Shakespeare. So same sort of authors that we see recurrent of recurrent interest in the writers of the period, although Spencer is different uh, insofar as Spencer really is dealing with a Christian um, romantic, not in, in the contemporary romantic sense, but uh, an age of chivalry. And he, he, he's attracted to that. You can see it in his poetry. There's a lot of knights and ladies and, and so forth. Um, when he was eight, his father dies. Fractures his skull falling from a horse. Uh, his mother remarries. Um, um, no, short, shortly thereafter. You cannot, one of the things that you find when you study historical figures is how many of them are blighted by terrific um, familial disruptions, like deaths of parents and stuff like that. And um, I'm not sure what you conclude from it. It makes them stronger, or is it just simply this happens and some people get through it and flourish in it, but it's rare these days when you meet people whose parents have died at that age. It, it happens, but it's, it's more rare. Death happens a lot. You're, when I read period, uh, uh, authors of this period, their children die regularly. It's a regular aspect of their life. And in this case, fathers die. They can, leave, like Wordsworth, left effectively an orphan. And then, of course, that factors into his outlook on life. It really does. I think that's a significant feature that most academics tend to ignore is the effect of losing parents on the outlook of the, of the writer. And it does change the world when mom or dad, particularly when dad dies. It's transformative. Um, when he's 14, his mother also dies. So his father dies at eight, his mother dies at 14. She dies of tuberculosis and leaves the, uh, the children in the grandmother's custody and she appoints two uh, guardians to look after them. And uh, Keats has to leave school and goes to train to be an apprentice with a man by the name of Thomas Hammond who was a surgeon and an apothecary. So an apothecary, he made medicines from chemicals. A surgeon, he cut off limbs. Like surgeons, don't think of modern surgery. There's no anesthetics. They take a bone, a bone, a saw, and cut the bone. Um, and Keats was in the attic above the surgery. Very difficult time, although in, in many ways it was a, a tranquil time for Keats. I think he was settled because he had a male guardian. And that, that, that was good for him. Um, he did get two bequests when he was this age, um, which were held in trust till he turned 21. So he, had no, he was poor, but he had the expectation of money coming. Again, also a factor in every character's life is what are their, what's their financial situation? How does it motivate them? Um, he never really got it. But he, so he apprenticed, and I think that's not insignificant. Um, in 1815, began a five-year uh, medical apprenticeship. He was registered as a medical student at Guy's Hospital, which is in London. It's still there, uh, part of King's College. Um, he got an apprenticeship dressing wounds, um, assisting surgeons, so he's like a you know, a, an assistant surgeon, really early on, right? That's, and um, it showed that he had some aptitude. He was attentive, careful, um, interested, and uh, probably overworked, like almost every medical student is then. If you know anything about med school and what comes after, you graduate, you got the doctorate, and now you find yourself working. I think it's changed a little bit, but it's 100-hour work weeks. Like, it's just brutal. Um, but if he finished it, then he would have done well for himself. 
because they, it was an honorable profession and would have given him financial security. And he probably really wanted to do it when he first started doing it. But while he was there, um, it was cutting into his writing time and he grew to realize that he wanted to be a writer, not a surgeon. Doesn't have the money for it having said that. So here's the problem, the dilemma. I have the gifts for this, that doesn't pay. I'm being trained for this, that does pay. He doesn't have any wealthy benefactors to choose uh, what he feels gifted at and he's left with this, you know, this dilemma of what do I do? Do I become a poet, which I feel I have the gifts to do and ought to do, or do I do what I'm being trained to do, which will provide the security which I need? And uh, he fell into depression over it, and uh, he feared that he would never become a poet and felt that he ought to so strongly that he set aside his um, career as a surgeon, he, even though he got an apothecary's license in 1816. So he's like, a, what does this make him a pharmacist? That's what it makes him. So an apothecary, you mix the chemicals. If you ever watched, uh, what's it called? It's a Wonderful Life. You know, he sits there in the back room and he puts the powder into the pills. That's what the apothecary does. He's putting the powder into and measuring it and mixing it. And okay, there you go. There's the medicine. You actually have to hand prepare it. Um, so he's, he's got the license and that makes him eligible to do all of the above, to be an apothecary, to be a physician and even a surgeon. So he is actually set to do that, but he decides not to do that. Tells his guardians, I'm not going to do what I am now licensed to do. I'm going to be a poet. You can imagine that didn't go over very well. Still working in Guy's Hospital, but he more and more devotes himself to poetry. And uh, he's introduced in 1816 to Lee Hunt, who is a friend of Byron and Shelley. And Hunt is and, and a progressive politically, etc. But again, very interested in the literary life. And that's why Keats gets introduced to him. And uh, five months later in in uh, 1817, he produces uh, the first volume of his poetry, which is well received, um, but not much uh, by the critics, but not much interest to the public. And that matters because he needs money. They're not buying his volume of poetry, but the critics think this is pretty good. Um, uh, he can, but he's, he's got enough, um, enough encouragement to continue uh, to do that. And, um, well, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about Keats's life. This keeps falling over and collapsing and going sideways. Um, ooh, that would go sideways badly. Um, but he presses on with his intention to become a poet and he gets more and more success. And Lee Hunt publishes in a, an essay called Three Young Poets, Shelley, Keats, and Reynolds. And the sonnet that we're gonna first look at here. Oh, are, are we? We are in a sec, oh, there it is. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, and uh, foresees great things of young Master Keats on the basis of this poem. And he introduces him to prominent literary figures. And this is important because he'll have patronage then. It's important for every, um, every young writer that they have a patron of some sort because if you don't have the financial means to do this yourself, you need someone to recognize talent and be willing to support it. And so the history of literature is often the history of men who have found a wealthy patron who's willing to back them financially. Dante had one, so did Virgil. Uh, so do most writers. But then you require people of wealth to take an interest in that sort of thing. These days, there's not much interest in poetry, probably because it shot itself in the foot by writing terrible poetry for centuries. But anyway. Uh, introduced to the editor of the Times, he's introduced to Charles Lamb, uh, various conductors, 
a poet by the name of John Hamilton Reynolds, who becomes a close friend. And he'll write letters to him. We'll look at some of his letters to Reynolds. He met regularly with William Hazlitt, who's a very important literary figure. We're not going to look at Hazlitt, but Hazlitt alongside Coleridge is the great critic of his day, a left-leaning uh, figure. And when he comes into the acquaintance of these gentlemen, it transforms his life. He starts to get invitations to things and um, becomes a, a representative of what uh, Hunt calls a new school of poetry. So now he's on the rise, a rising star would how he would be seen in the London literary scene, which is the most important in England. And it's then when he starts reflecting in his famous letters uh, to Hunt, to Bailey, uh, to others. So the, the famous phrase, which we'll pick up on in a few uh, classes, I am certain of nothing but of the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of the imagination. What imagination seizes as beauty must be truth, which is a theme which is picked up in the Ode on the Grecian Urn, which we're going to read, uh, not today, but in a class or maybe two. I can't remember what I've got there. Uh, but very much pushing in this direction, and he's decided at this point just to, as I say, abandon the uh, medical field altogether because of his introduction to prominent literary figures and his desire and belief that he has a gift that he, uh, it's death for him to ignore. He sees it as a life and death matter. His whole being is caught up in being a writer. Sadly, he did not uh, live for very long. But I, I want to read this, uh, these first few works. Well, I guess I should conclude with. Uh, um, he wrote very briefly. Um, in 1818, he goes on walking tours. Um, his brothers emigrate, or one of his brothers, uh, George, uh, moves to. Ohio and then Louisville um, and uh, most of his friends and family die of tuberculosis. It's, it's actually quite a tragic life and um, uh, Keats too gets sick and he nurses his brother who has tuberculosis and he probably contracts it there himself. Um, <clears throat> His brother dies on the 1st of September, 1818. Um, and then in that summer of 1819, uh, or the spring of 1819, he writes this, the, ode, the spring odes, the sequence of poems, which are his best known works. Uh, the Ode to Psyche, the Ode to a Nightingale, the Ode on a Grecian Urn, the Ode to um, Autumn. Etc. Ode to Melancholy. Um, and then he realizes somewhere in the midst of this, and it's unclear exactly when, that he has tuberculosis and that he is probably going to die himself. And he, he leaves England, goes to Italy, warmer climate in hope that the climate might help him cope and recover from it. He doesn't, he dies in Italy shortly thereafter. Um, but let's look at this one first of all. The, the, the first poem is, interestingly, he doesn't follow the first generation in their choice of literary form. This is what I like about him. He's a bit like Byron in the sense of he, he, he's his own man. Uh, he's not going to just imitate Wordsworth and Coleridge. As I say, nobody reads Blake. But he's not going to be Till later, he, become, he becomes significant later in his life, but, but they're not talking about Blake as a poetic influence at all. He, he only becomes interesting really when Northrop Fry adopts him as the great romantic poet. Whether Fry is correct or not, I don't know. But um, uh, Blake is a latecomer. He's not influential in the 19th century at all, whereas the three men that we talk about as the second generation, they're all very influential. Um, and and um, but early on, he writes sonnets. We see that Wordsworth writes sonnets too. We've seen a few sonnets by Wordsworth. But the sonnet is a Renaissance literary form. 
and Keats uh, tries his hand at this particular form. And it's on Chapman's Homer, so it is on the subject of Greece. And let me just say a bit about Greece at this point. Um, we associate both Greece and Rome with classicism, right? The classical world. But there is a difference between Greece and Rome insofar as Greece is more strongly associated with nature and therefore with the sublime. And Rome is more strongly associated with the beautiful and civilization. And that sort of general portrait um, is, is uh, forged in the 18th century, particularly in Germany. And I, I could get into that, but, and I'll say more about that maybe when we talk about the Ode on a Grecian Urn. Uh, that would be more appropriate there. Uh, but Greece starts to bec becomes very, very significant in English letters as well because of the German influence and the belief that Greek art is the most sublime comparatively. They're not influenced, by, so it's not the, when we think of the Renaissance in the England of the 16th century and Italy of the 14th century and talk about the rebirth, it's the rebirth of Roman civilization when we come to the 18th and 19th century and talk about neoclassicism, it starts to lean towards Greece. And the reason it goes towards Greece is that Greece is more natural. It's closer to nature, it's more powerful, it's more emphatic, it's not derivative, it's original. And the Romans just copy and repeat what the, what the Greeks did. So the Romans are not interested in Rome, they're not interested in Christendom that arises out of it, they wanna go back to the sources. So for Keats, Homer is this. Now I say Homer, Dante hadn't even read Homer. It, his work was lost to the West. It, it, it emerged um, later on. Likewise, there was very little left of Plato and even Aristotle in Western literature, the, the development of these, these men. It's a late comer, Greek, liter Greek literature, Greek philosophy comes in by Islam from Eastern Christendom. The monks, they bring that with them. So it's not influential on the Italian Renaissance, which is largely, as I say, a Latin-based movement. The Greek influence comes later. Even though we now, when I teach the course, I say Homer influences Virgil and Virgil influences, and yes, but it would not have been the case in the Renaissance. I just say that. But he's writing on Chapman's Homer. I, the reason I don't like this website is it has so much clutter around it. No, I don't want that. So I'll just read it, and then we'll comment. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, Chapman is a translator, I believe 17th century, might be even be 16th century, very early translator. Good translation. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pu pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Cortez, the explorer that goes around the uh, tip of South America and sees the Pacific for the first time. This is how he feels like some watcher of the skies when he sees a new planet through a telescope or when the explorer, he's a, new, a new world has opened up to him. When he reads Chapman for the first time, Chapman's Homer. He'd heard reputations, Homer's reputation spoken of, but till he read this translation, it was not clear to him why the reputation was even merited. And yet now he knows. Um, this is a very early poem of his, but you can already see a, uh, a very easy reading style. Um, in terms of the structure, 
uh, gold seen being hold, it's an A, B, B, A, told, domain, serene, bold, same thing, A, B, B, A. And then he will go into uh, uh, the sestet, so the octave there, bold, and then the colon here, which will connect the two, but move into the sestet, then felt I like some watch of the skies, can eyes, men, surmise. Darien. Okay. What we will find with Keats at this early stage is his experimentation with the sonnet. He will move it around. He will try different rhyme schemes. What he's doing is he's doing what he does to some degree what Milton does uh, at an early age, which he's trying out form and exploring it and trying to find his own voice within the form. Um, and, and he will, he will use sometimes a, a Spenserian sonnet, sometimes a Shakespearean sonnet, sometimes he'll follow a Petrarchan scheme. He will move all around and try and see what best suits him. But all of it is training. I think he sees himself as a poet in training, the way Milton did in his early uh, poetry. Although in the case of Milton, I think he already regards himself as a master <laughs> when he's Keats's age. But he recognizes also that there are certain types of poetry that one ought not to try at a young age, and, and, and the epic is one of them. You don't write an epic when you're 19 years of age. You don't have the amplitude of mind, the breadth of experience or whatever to take this on. You take on lesser forms of poetry. So Milton wrote an ode, the Nativity Ode, when he was 21. Keats is not even that age. He's writing sonnets. Okay, well, that's a lesser form. It's a lyric poet, poem. Good. Start with that. Uh, work with that. And then Milton moves on to other forms and I would say masters them all. Gives, a, gives the, in some ways, the best of its type. Uh, Keats never gets that far. But he does try in early days to write epic and fails in my mind as well. He ought not to have tried, and he probably wouldn't have tried if he hadn't been ill. I think he realized he was going to die, and he thinks he's a great poet, and he's going to show he's a great poet by writing an epic, and I think you can't shortcut that process. Anyway, that's the first poem. The second, on seeing the Elgin Marbles, the Elgin Marbles are extraordinarily controversial uh, these days. Uh, in their day, a little bit, but probably not so much so. Um, it, they come about because uh, we've already seen that, that Byron goes to Greece and fights a war of independence from the Turk. Turks have occupied Greece, and they've been, the Ottoman Turks have occupied Greece for a long time. Now, there's a historic conflict there between the Persians and the Greeks, right? If you read Herodotus or, um, or, or any of the accounts of the period, the, 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 the historic conflict between Persia and Greece is part of uh, Greek national identity. And the, um, the Ottoman Turks overthrowing of, of Greece and making it a sort of a, a province of, of uh, of the Ottoman Turks, of Islam, uh, by implication, is a, is a national defeat on a, which has really significant national consciousness uh, implications. And, and one of them is that the, the Parthenon at the center of Greece and the marbles and the statues just lie on the ground. And nobody's tending to them. They're just there because the, 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 the pride of the nation has been already destroyed by occupation. Lord Elgin comes along, takes these marbles, puts them on a ship, takes them back to England. Says the Greeks don't even care about their own culture. We care about the culture. We'll, we'll, we'll preserve it here. We'll put them in a museum. They're called the Elgin Marbles, but they're put on a ship. They're very extraordinarily heavy marble. 
I mean, marble is not a light thing to, to pick it up and excavate. It. it happens, there's all sorts of Greek art, uh, statuary and so forth, which is picked up and taken to other, the, the Germans do set the same thing in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. Uh, but these marbles were displayed in, uh, in public and Keats went and saw them and saw the beauty of the marbles in the statuary. By the way, the Greeks want them back. They said that the, 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 the Germans, or rather the English, have taken their natural, their, their native patrimony and they are robbers and you need to return them. And the, the English say, well, you can't preserve them as well or look after them as well as we can. It's, Sort of extraordinary. It's a it's a diplomatic. Um, there's there's a, a extraordinarily bad feeling on the Greeks' part over this. So well, when we found them, they nobody wanted them. And they go, well, yeah, but now we want them, so give them back. And they won't give them back. They still haven't given them back. But if you read up on it, you'll find the dispute over the Elgin marbles to this day. Well, one of the thing about the Elgin marbles is they they are often on a plinth. So you can walk around them and see them from different sides. That'll be important when we come to the Ode on a Grecian Urn. But he's seeing them for the first time, and what he is seeing is what has been claimed to be sublime art. So there's a German critic by the name of Winkelmann who talks about the silent grandeur of Greek statuary. There's a great debate between Winkelmann and Lessing over uh, the various merits of of poetry versus statuary and so forth. I'm not going to get into that here. Um, but, but this debate, which is very important in Germany, has now transferred uh, into England now. And there are people who speak of the grandeur of Greek art and its sublimity, etc., in English shores. Again, Keats now, so he just talked about Chapman's Homer. Now he's going to look at Greek statuary as well. My spirit is too weak. Mortality weighs heavily on me like unwilling sleep. And each imagined pinnacle and steep of godlike hardship tells me I must die like a sick eagle looking at the sky. Yet tis a gentle luxury to weep that I have not the cloudy winds to keep fresh for the opening of the morning's eye. Such dim conceived glories of the brain bring round the heart an undescribable feud. So do these wonders a most dizzy pain that mingles Grecian grandeur with the rude wasting of old time, with a billowy mane, a sun, a shadow of a magnitude. So, what we see coupled here is a theme that he will pick up in again in his Spring Odes, which is the connection between perfect art and mortality and the conflict between them. Timeless grandeur to which somebody is not only mortal but conscious of their mortality because of the world in which he lives. Remember in the, the surgeries and with relatives dying of tuberculosis, and he, he eventually falling prey to that himself. But an awareness of his mortality. This is very much a part of Keats that's not there in any of the other poets. Keats is much more aware of the existential angst, as it were, of death. And because he's no Christian, he doesn't think it of it in those terms. He never thinks of it in theological terms. He thinks of it more in relation to immortality versus mortality. Those are the, those are the terms of engagement. But he, again, you look, at a, you look at a marble and you think about, I must die like a sick eagle looking at the sky, reference to himself. He has an eagle with wings to fly, but he's sick and can't. No, he's probably not sick when he writes this, but, or maybe he is, I don't know, but it's not, this is not a late poem. Uh, al but already meditating on themes that are, we will find throughout his entire poetic corpus. Mortality and pain and sickness 
on the one hand and grandeur and eternity and sublimity on the other. They are always parts of his discourse. Now again, look at the rhyme scheme, however. Just like the first one in the octave, ABBA, ABBA, and then he moves to C, D, C, E, D, D, same thing, right? C, D, C, D, C, D. Uh, Petrarchan, it's on it. He will not stick with the Italian sonnet. He will move to other ones. But early days, he's going to the original form and happy to engage with that. Now, Shakespeare would never have written a sonnet like this. Neither would the um, Italian Renaissance poets. The theme of grandeur, greatness, and mortality are very much Keatsian themes. Byron had no interest in them. Neither did Shelley. Neither did Wordsworth or Coleridge or Blake, none of them. The, it moves more in the, in the uh, direction of existential concerns, which are very much the late 19th century concerns of Dostoevsky and, uh, and Tolstoy. So if you remember the death of Ivan Illich, if you did that with me early on first year. Um, comments or questions about this, observations, anything you want to say? This keeps dipping. close to falling. No? Okay. Let me get rid of this. Dip, dip. Again, fourth, third poem rather that we're going to look at. When I have fears that I may cease to be, you think that death might be on his mind? It's, it's recurrent early on and it never stops being part of his consideration. And when he thinks of fear, he has fear. He is not placid in the face of death. He is, but his chief fear, in addition to fear of pain, is simply that he will die before he expresses his greatness as a poet. That's his chief fear. Not because God has given him a gift and God will hold him accountable, but because he won't have the immortality of the great poet. And he longs for immortality in a very pagan way, quite frankly, without any sense of the polytheistic worldview there, but in a sense that I will achieve lasting greatness only through the fame of my verse. And so that becomes his religion, as it were. So when I have fears that I may cease to be, when I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high piled books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel fair creature of an hour that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. Then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame to nothingness do sink. It's all desperate stuff. I get the sense he's terrified of death. surrounded by it, has compassion for it, but wants ultimately to escape it. And that sort of a sense of escapism is prominent throughout his poetic corpus. But you can see again another sonnet. But now look at the lines rhyme scheme. It's A, B, A, B. It's not A, B, B, A. It's B, brain, character, grain. Face, romance, trace, chance. 
A, B, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. So it moves, it, it's changing the uh, approach. The theme's the same, but the structure of the verse changes. And when, and, and note that it's an extended when. And the when is waiting the then. When this, then that. When I have fears, when I behold, and when I feel, then on the shore. That's the structure of it. If it were one sentence, it's when, when, and when, then. So because of the structure being as it is, that semantic structure lies within the poetic structure of the, of the verse scheme. And yet it, it is at odds with it. It's more like speech and more like thought. So it's more natural. It doesn't read like verse, even though it has features of verse. It has the rhyme scheme, as I say. But because of the structure, the semantic structure of the when, when, and then, and the then coming in the middle of the line, he, it's, it's more natural, more spontaneous, less, art, less self-consciously artificial. The artifice, it seems like he's dispensed with the artifice when he clearly hasn't. And this is part of the beauty. For me, this is what a good artist does. He uses artifice to sound like there's no art. There, it, it, he's not trying. It has just come out. He's worked very hard to do this, perhaps. Uh, young poets, when they want to have structure to the verse, will often slavishly copy a certain type or structure of poetry um, and stick with it so rigorously that they lose, it, it just sounds wooden. Um, which is one sort of failing. The other is just not to, to uh, pay attention to it at all. And so it just, it just sounds like somebody talking with no structure. He's trying to find the balance there in this. And uh, in that, I think he's following Wordsworth, who's also very good at this. And, and even the poets, though, that lean more in the rhyming couplet, 18th century type, Alexander Pope, for example, there's a lot of variety within his rhyming couplets there surprising, although I think rhyming couplets, f to my taste, are far too self-consciously artificial. I'm aware of the artifice there at all times, so I don't like that. Is it because I'm a romantic? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Milton doesn't do it either. You know, he uses blank verse uh, often, um, or he certainly doesn't stick to rhyming couplets, which he says is the product of a barbarous age, which is interesting. Anyway, uh, any comments about this? But again, it's the same sort of theme. I may cease to be, but I may cease to be when? Before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before I am able to capture my feelings, the essence of myself in writing. Now, what I said this uh, in the uh, class on uh, romanticism and that crisis of self-legitimation, he expresses it in his poetry. He feels that his crisis is that he should die before he is able to legitimize himself, his for, to, before he's able to put his feelings on paper. And if he does not do so, he will have lived in, in vain and died in vain. So he, need, he feels an existential uh, need to express what a, what a great poet he is. It's not like poets of yore, that they don't feel that same pressure. It's very much of a, an age of, uh, of atheism. Uh, when uh, Wordsworth read Keats's poetry, uh, his comment was that, that it was a pretty piece of paganism. People <laughs> The second generation didn't like Wordsworth very much, personally. They thought he was a pompous ass, which I think is a bit, which is a bit harsh. Well, maybe it isn't. Maybe he was. I don't know. Um, comments about this, but you can see a similarity of theme in, in the sonnets sequence. Final one, 
that I'm going to look at for today is not a sonnet. You might be glad to know. Uh, it is very much influenced by Spencer, but even more than Spencer, Coleridge. It's called a ballad, which is a song, uh, and yet it's a song about with a medieval setting, and yet it's marked by the dark, sublime, supernatural terror of works like Christabel. And um, I think you can even hear that in, in the poem. And yet, more than evil, there's just simply death in, in the poem. It's called La Belle Dame Sans Merci, a ballad. Let's read the whole thing through. It's, it's longer. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew. And on thy cheeks a fading rose, fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild and manna dew, and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore. And there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me to asleep, and there I dreamed. Ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame sans merci, thee hath, thee hath in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. So here we have the themes of death in the landscape. There are no birds singing. It's a strange setting where no birds are singing. I don't know if this is anecdotal, whether it's actually even true, but I recall having heard that one of the things that struck, and I'm sure, it, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but that at the, um, in the concentration camps at Auschwitz and Birkenau, the comment was that they heard no birds singing. I don't even know if that's true, but I recall having read that. Um, it's a sign of joylessness. It's a, it's a sign of joylessness. It's a sign of death. And likewise, the sedge is withered from the lake. Everything's dried up. Life is gone. Joy is gone. And the woman that she, he meets, with the pale kings and princes too, as I say, it reminds me of, of uh, Coleridge's uh, narrative of a creature that is part serpent, part woman. And it may be what he will write later, it might be a lamia. And the lamia is a mythological beast that a succubus, if you're interested in looking it up, that uh, possesses her victims as it were. And I think you can probably read that into the poem. There is a sort of a possession going on here 
There's also sexual nuances here in Keats that you will not find in all the other poets, but they are in Keats. More strongly represented, I would say, certainly than Wordsworth and, and, and even Coleridge. Um, and I think that's going on here as well. A fairy's child is how she's depicted at first, but she's not a fairy's child. She is a, she is a predator. And, and he is being robbed of something. There's a death uh, that comes from her embrace that's expressed in, in the poem. But it's, it's, note, it begins with, oh, what can ail thee, knighted arms, alone and palely loitering, the sedge has withered. Oh, what can ail thee? It's a little bit like the rhyme of the ancient mariner as well. How did you get to this state? And then he tells a story, and then he returns to it at the end. So it adds the structure, it begins. The sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. And it concludes with exactly the same lines. Come on. Though the sedge is withered. And this is why I sojourn here. Because he was left there bereft after some demonic encounter with some sort of fairy, as it's called there. Now, it's called La Belle Dame Sans Merci. He comes back to this theme in the Lamia, and there he will um, extend the narrative, and he will include the themes of Paradise Lost into it. So he will build on it. Now, what's interesting to me in Keats is that you can see progression in, within his poetry. Similar sorts of themes of death, mortality, um, eternity, uh, poetry, the importance of feeling, of expressing the feeling to immortalize it, etc., but also sort of uh, uh, demonic influences. He very much likes this in his his poetry, and and satanic, uh, for that matter. But he, I'd say I think he's leaning on on Coleridge very much in this poem, from works that we've already read. Can you see that yourselves? The, yeah, I mean, I think we read enough Coleridge to pick that up. And then the story begins in stanza four. I met a lady in the meads. How did this happen? I met a lady. Full beautiful. Her eyes were wild. Something not quite right about her. Lola to sleep. He goes to dream, the latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hillside, and he sees the pale kings and horses, pale warriors, death pale, and they cry just like that. Exact same scene that we see in, um, in Coleridge, where there are, are others, a spiritual world involved in, in the scene that speak into it. Uh, so any thoughts on this yourself? Anything that I didn't pick up. Note the rhyme scheme has moved away, or rather the structure of the verse. It's called a, uh, a ballad. Um, and it has, but again, a very tight structure. It begins where it ends, or it ends where it begins, and has a frame narrative there within it. Um, but very much you can see the influence of Coleridge. Again, this is rather uh, early verse. I guess everything's early verse for Keats since he doesn't live that long. But Considering the length of his poetic career, it's early on in that. And is a, is a moving poem. It's, it's quite well done, I think. But he's very much inf interested uh, in the imagination. This is one final thing I should say about Keats as, the, as an introduction. He mentions the imagination. Uh, Coleridge says how important the imagination is. Shelley talks about the imagination. Um, and so does Blake. Byron, not so much. He doesn't emphasize the imagination in the same way. It's, it's not really interested in theorizing about the imagination. But Keats is very much interested in the imagination, this power. And, and we'll, we'll look at some of his letters to uh, tease that out, what he thinks about the imagination, uh, which is primarily in his, in his letters. He doesn't write treatises or um, 
defenses of poetry or anything like that, but he does write in his letters a great deal which has influenced others. He's actually most, almost most famous for his epistles. Very interesting. Any comments, thoughts? How do you like Keats? Say everyone likes Keats. It's hard not to like Keats. I like Keats. Um, as I say, he doesn't wade into politics too much, which, for better or for worse, when a, when, a, when a poet writes about politics too much and you don't live in that same era, you lose the references and it, do, it just sort of like, I don't know what he's talking about. So by avoiding that, it keeps a freshness to Keats. He's talking about perennial human themes, and to some degree, that's why he has retained his excellence. Yes, because of that. Yeah. Let me turn this off. 